Hello everyone, we are back in the witty guy witty office, the mojo dojo casa house, if you will. And today we are going to be talking about the film, Wings of Desire. You might notice that the camera is in a different position and this microphone is on a stand here. And the reason for that is because I've actually recorded this video before. I recorded it yesterday and then when I went back to play back the audio for the video, it sounded like this. Hello everyone, we're back in the witty guy witty office. Now obviously that is completely unusable, and so all of my footage from yesterday is ruined. So this will be my second attempt at recording this video. This time I'm recording to OBS instead of to my laptop, which has my professional audio editing software. I have no idea what the problem was, and I am not smart enough to fix it, so this is what we're doing right now, and I hope you enjoy, but let's get into the actual meat of the topic. Wings of Desire is a German film from the year 1987. The original German title was Der Himmel über Berlin, or The Skies Over Berlin, but it was changed to Wings of Desire for its English release. And by English release, I mean it's still in German, but it has an English title. It was written and directed by Wim Wenders, who won the award for Best Director at the Cannes Film Festival that year, for this movie. And the story follows the journey and experiences of two angels who are charged with watching over the people of the city of Berlin. Angels who are meant to bring unseen comfort to the citizens of Berlin, but are never allowed to interact with them. The tone of this film is very contemplative and very somber, and it is very poetic in its writing, in its language, and in its actual story. It is the story of an angel who longs for a different life and finds it when he falls in love with a woman on Earth. And above all, it is a love letter from the director vendors to a broken and divided Germany. This is the story of Wings of Desire. So let's get into it. It's weird having both hands free to record this video. I have no idea what to do with my hands. We begin with an excerpt from a poem by Austrian poet Peter Hanke, who composed this poem specifically for use in this movie. When the child was a child, it walked with its arms swinging, wanted the brook to be a river, the river to be a torrent, and this puddle to be the sea. When the child was a child, it didn't know that it was a child. Everything was soulful, and all souls were one. When the child was a child, it had no opinion about anything, had no habits, it often sat cross-legged, took off running, had a cowlick in its hair, and made no faces when photographed. This is a great poem about the mind and the experiences of a child. In childhood, the imagination is allowed to soar. It is not burdened down by the troubles and worries of the world. It only sees the world through that lens of its own innocent imagination. We then see shots of Berlin from the sky above. This is the perspective of the angels flying over the city. And it is in these skies that we meet the protagonist of our story, and that is Damiel the Angel, who is played to perfection by Swiss actor Bruno Ganz. He is standing atop a large building in the city of Berlin with his wings folded behind him. Rather than being depicted as blonde-haired warriors in full armor like so many adaptations of angels are in the Renaissance, these angels are stoic and clad in black overcoats. They truly feel as though they are beings who have existed since the very beginning of the earth. And many of the children of the city look up and see this angel watching over them. In this story, the mind of a child is so innocent and untroubled with the world around it that they are allowed to perceive the angels that walk amongst them and fly above them. And when a person grows up, they tragically lose this ability. The angels are also able to hear the thoughts of the people down below, and they can tune into the experiences of an individual as if tuning into a radio station. And so Damiel appears inside of an airplane and listens to the thoughts of its passengers. And one of the voices is speaking English, and to me sounded very familiar when watching this movie. And that is because it is the voice of American actor Peter Falk. The actor who played the grandpa in The Princess Bride. As you wish. And fittingly enough, he is playing an American actor who is flying to Berlin for a shoot. Which is insanely hilarious, considering that in order to shoot this movie, he was an American actor flying to Berlin. 
for a shoot. <laughs> it's... I love it. I love it so much. After this scene, we once again take to the sky and begin observing the people down below. This film is very interesting because it isn't really concerned with telling a story. Rather, it is interested in putting us into the shoes of these angels who are charged with watching over humanity but unallowed to interfere. Many of the scenes in this film are simply little vignettes or windows into the life and story of individuals going around the city, little mundane events that we as humans normally experience. But when viewed from the angel's perspective, there is this undertone of longing, a longing for a world that the angels cannot touch. It's a simple and sometimes difficult life, but it is a life of experience and a life of purpose. I hope that I sound okay. I tried to mimic the same filters, same audio filters that I have on my laptop, but I feel like it sounds different, but I hope it still sounds good. I wanted to record this video on Monday. It's Friday now. <laughs> and we then get another excerpt from the poem at the beginning of the film. When the child was a child, it was the time for these questions. Why am I me and why not you? Why am I here and why not there? When did time begin and where does space end? Is life under the sun not just a dream? Is what I see and hear and smell not just an illusion of the world before the world? Given the facts of evil and people, does evil really exist? How can it be that I who I am didn't exist before I came to be, and that someday I who I am will no longer be who I am? Of course, the language of this is a little bit pretentious, I will admit, but it is meant to be the philosophical ponderings of a child. The mind of an adult is consumed with running from one place to the next, overburdened with finances, politics, and other stresses of the world. But a child isn't burdened with these same thoughts, and so their minds turn towards curiosity about themselves and about the world around them, and their place in the universe. Why am I me and not someone else? Where did time begin and where will time end? What was I before I existed, and what will I be when I cease to be one day? These are the questions that the children ask, questions that only the angels can hear. But not only do the angels observe humanity and listen to their thoughts, but they also offer unseen, invisible comfort. As an example of this, we see a pregnant woman in an ambulance with her husband. Nothing's wrong, she's merely experiencing the discomfort that comes with the later days of pregnancy. Damiel appears in the ambulance with them and places his hand on the woman's stomach, soothing the kicking baby. Nothing visible happens. The angels are not permitted to interact with humanity or heal them by some miraculous act. All they can do is sit there unseen and offer invisible comfort. The portrayal of angels in this film is very similar to modern ideas of guardian angels. They can never be seen, only felt on some intangible level by those who are suffering. And after this, we witness a meeting between Damiel and another angel by the name of Cassiel. Cassiel then gives Damiel his report on the day and the people he has seen. He talks about the exact times that the sun and the moon will rise and set that day. He talks about the history of the city of Berlin itself. And he talks about the mundane stories and experiences of the people he has witnessed today. People he has watched and people he has given comfort to. In den Rehbergen las ein alter Mann ein Kind aus der Odyssee vor und der kleine Zuhörer, der dabei ganz zu blinzeln aufhörte. Damiel then gives his own report on the people he's seen, and he makes the really cool remark that he came upon a blind woman in his adventures, and she was able to sense his presence. Eine Blinde, die nach ihrer Uhr tastete, als sie mich spürte. Which gives us the really cool idea that in the absence of sight, this woman is one layer of reality closer to the angels, or at least in the absence of one sense, she is able to pick up on other senses that we normally cannot perceive. Damiel then trails off for a moment. While he does feel blessed to be able to offer comfort to the people of Berlin, he does long in his heart for a less spiritual and more physical existence. 
He wants to feel the sensations of substance and impermanence that humans feel. To his credit, Cassiel does entertain this monologue for a good time, but then tells Damiel to stay the course and continue his duties. This then helps us to establish the actual purpose that the angels have here. As Cassiel says, do no more than look, assemble, testify, and preserve. The goal of the angels on Earth in this movie is to preserve the history of humanity from the grandiose to the ordinary. All of the mundane acts of ordinary humans preserved forever in the records of the angels, which is a really cool idea to me. I'm going to be saying that a lot, just so you know. <laughs> There's lots of cool ideas in this movie. We then go to the public library in Berlin, which is full of angels watching over the people there. I'm going to keep saying Berlin for this entire film, but I'm actually referring to West Berlin because at the time this movie was filmed, the Berlin Wall still divided Germany. It's never addressed in the film, but it almost feels as though this library is some kind of base of operations for the angels because of the sheer amount of angels that can be found in this library. We then get this cool shot of Damiel reaching over and picking up a pen from a desk, but because he is immaterial, he can only pick up the spiritual essence of a pen. And so his translucent hand picks up a translucent pen, but leaves the physical pen there on the desk. It's just really cool, especially because all of the techniques done to portray the angels and their disconnect from reality are done in camera, and I think that's insanely cool. He then sits and contemplates the pen, a reminder of the physical world around him that he cannot touch. We then cut to Damiel on public transportation, which is full of people who are all going through something, but one person in particular catches his eye. He reads the man's thoughts, and he can see that this man is truly alone in the world. His wife and parents have left him, and he is no longer allowed to see his children anymore. And so Damiel sits beside this man and places his hand gently on the man's shoulder. While the man, of course, cannot feel this, his posture does straighten after a time, and his thoughts begin to become more hopeful and less hopeless. This is the power of the angels. They are not performing a miracle in a sense, they are merely opening the door to a shift in perspective and allowing the people themselves to walk through that door. It is an ordinary shift in perspective and outlook facilitated by the angels. It doesn't work 100% of the time. Sometimes the human does not choose to walk through that door, but in this case, we see it work. After this, Damiel travels to the circus, and it is here that his perspective on reality and existence would be forever changed. Practicing on the high ropes is a trapeze artist by the name of Marion. She is dressed like an angel and rehearsing for her act. Marion is played by French actress Solveig Domartin, who in preparation for this movie learned the art of trapeze and performed all of her stunts in this movie completely unassisted, which is insanely impressive. And for the first time, we cut to the perspective of the real world. For this whole time, we have been viewing things from the perspective of the angels, but this time we view things from the ground and the whole world is in full vibrant color. See, I never actually mentioned it up until this point, but all of the perspective of the angels, which is the majority of this film, is shot in black and white. This emphasizes to us once again that the angels are in the world, but separate from the world. And so briefly, we get a glimpse of this real world as Marion swings above us in full color. We then cut back to Damiel's perspective in black and white, as the circus performers receive the news that they can no longer afford to continue operating, and so the circus will be closing early this season. Damiel listens to Marion's thoughts. She is sad about the circus ending and not looking forward to the inevitable job search that she will have to undergo, which can relate. <laughs> I've been applying to jobs here since July and no one's called me. <laughs> I'm moving back home next month. Back to the story though. It is here in the circus tent that for the very first time in his immortal life, 
the angel Damiel felt the glimmer of infatuation. I love the poetry in this scene. Of course, if an angel were ever to fall in love with a human on Earth, it would be with a woman who can fly. She spends her life reaching up to the angels, and one day, an angel noticed and decided to reach back. Damiel listens to her thoughts and knows that she feels truly alone in this world, and so he comes alongside her, offering invisible comfort as he has done to so many other people before. This works, and her eyes temporarily open to the beauty of the world around her. But she still feels a sense of purposelessness. She doesn't know what she is meant to do in life. And above all, she longs for a loving connection. And in her thoughts, she talks about longing to go and see the beautiful colors, whether it is the brilliant oranges and yellows of a beautiful sunset or the neon lights of the city. This has a twofold effect on Damiel. Firstly, his love for Marion only deepens in getting to know her on this intimate level, but also it increases his longing to experience these colors as well. And as Damiel leaves, the color returns to Marion's world. He leaves and then almost immediately comes upon a motorcycle rider who was hit by a car. He is laying on the ground dying when Damiel finds him, and he can hear the man's thoughts of all he had hoped to do and accomplish in the future, from the extraordinary to the ordinary. And as the man lays there dying, Damiel kneels behind him and places his hands on his head to comfort him in his final moments. And something cool that happens here as the man is listing all of these things he wish he had done, Damiel starts to say them along with him, as if knowing exactly what this man is about to say. Just got a text, my car alarm keeps going off. It's probably an electrical issue that I'm going to have to deal with. I kind of want to finish recording this video first, though. It is then that a younger man arrives, presumably a relative of the man who was hit, to offer comfort to him, and so Damiel leaves, but as he does, he can still hear the dying thoughts of this man echoing in his head. We then cut to the angel Cassiel, who is sitting in the library listening to the thoughts of an old man who has come to read. This man talks about how much the times have changed, and how when he was younger he used to idolize the kings and warriors of his childhood, but nowadays he longs for and envies the peaceful rulers. And as he says this, we cut to actual, real footage of Berlin immediately after World War II. This old man was there 40 years ago to see the horrors and devastation of war, and was forever changed by it. We see footage of buildings that have been leveled, and bodies that are piled up in the streets. This movie may take place in the middle of the Cold War, but the wounds of World War II are still very fresh. And if you do watch this film for yourself, huge, massive disclaimer, content warning, all that stuff. Because this is very real footage of very real dead people, and it's very disturbing in that regard. This is very sobering to see, but it also shows us where the director of this film is coming from, being a German man himself. The old man laments about how war is so naturally easy for humans, and no one yet in these long centuries has managed to sing an anthem for peace. And so he questions what is so inherently wrong about peace that it is never allowed to persist. Cassiel then follows this man as he walks to the Berlin Wall, which was still up at the time of filming. He thinks about the cafe that used to stand here, and all of the memories from his childhood that he has in what was once a thriving plaza. But now, there is only dust, and a giant, oppressive concrete wall. And as he describes the beauty that used to be here, we see more World War II footage of buildings that were destroyed by bombing campaigns in World War II. The place used to be filled with joyful citizens, horse-drawn carriages, and giant trees that stretched up to the sky. But then it was overrun by the banners and flags of the Nazis. Suddenly the people were no longer friendly, and the decay of this man's Germany that he remembers in his youth 
began. Now where are the heroes? Where are the friendly neighbors? All of this has come to dust. He alone remembers what Germany used to be before the decay of the Nazis and the horrors of war. And the story of a beautiful Germany at peace will die with him. He believes that this story will die with him, but little does he know the angel Cassiel is standing over him listening. Even if this man couldn't see him, his stories of the war will not die with him. Cassiel then stands in front of a giant sculpture of two wings, which gives the illusion that he has wings on his back, which is really cool. There's lots of cool angelic imagery with wings in this movie, and this has no relevance to the story, but it just looked cool. I hope I found a picture to show you all because it, I think it's cool. He then encounters a young woman on the side of the street who is trying to make money on the side of the street. This is YouTube, so I'm gonna leave what she's doing to your imagination. It is clear from her thoughts that she does not want to be doing this. However, she feels as though she has no choice. The road she's on is busy, which leaves her terrified of being recognized by one of the passers-by. She thinks of a man named Klaus and begins to cry. Klaus, of course, died before this. Whoever he was, she wishes that he were still alive and still here to look after her. She is alone and desperate, and so she does this because she feels like she has to. Cassiel then leaves this scene and begins commenting on the state of Germany. The country is more divided than it has ever been, and not just because of the Berlin Wall. There are more borders than ever, even individual streets act as their own borders. And no one dares anymore to cross these borders and meet their neighbor. As he says, the German people are divided into as many states as there are individuals. And these small states are mobile. Each one takes his own with him and demands a toll when another wants to enter. No one is willing to give a chance to anyone anymore in this Germany. Everyone feels purposeless and are so focused on self that there is no regard to the other. And Cassiel looks out of the window of the vehicle he is sitting in, but rather than seeing the streets of modern Berlin, he sees the ruin of the war and the buildings that collapsed in the bombings and the tanks. This section of the movie gives us true insight into Wenders' actual purpose with this movie. Director Wenders was born in Germany, and he loves his country and the people in it. But as a German, he also knows the history of his country and how the people there have been beaten down for decades, whether it was by dictators within or foreign powers afterwards. And all of that division now is symbolized in the Berlin Wall. This film is a love letter to Germany, but also a lament for what Germany has become. The vehicle Cassiel is riding in then stops at a film set, the very same film set that Peter Falk was flying to, to film a movie at. This film is about the history of Germany, and so there are actors dressed in Nazi uniforms, as well as actors wearing the yellow Star of David on their clothing. Damiel then joins Cassiel, and the two of them watch as Peter Falk tries to find the correct hat for his character. And it is confirmed in this scene that he is indeed playing himself in this movie. Damiel then walks among the extras in this movie and listens to their thoughts. One woman in particular is remembering coming back to Berlin after the war. The city was in ruins, including the majority of what was once her house. Peter comes up to this woman and asks if he can draw her, and Damiel listens to both of their thoughts as she poses and Peter attempts to sketch her in his notebook. Peter comments to himself on the yellow star on her jacket, the yellow star that meant death for so many people, and he wonders why the Nazis picked yellow to be the color of death. Damiel then puts his hand on Cassiel's shoulder and takes him to see the circus. They watch in amusement as a parade of circus performers takes the stage. They are all dressed as animals or as clowns, and they are all playing instruments. And as the children in the audience laugh with glee, we get another excerpt from that poem at the beginning of the movie. 
When the child was a child, it awoke once in a strange bed, and now does so again and again. Many people then seemed beautiful, and now only a few do, by sheer luck. It had visualized a clear image of paradise, and now can at most guess. Could not conceive of nothingness, and shudders today at the thought. When the child was a child, it played with enthusiasm, and now has just as much excitement as then, but only when it concerns its work. More philosophical ponderings that I will leave to you to interpret. Marion, who is dressed as a cat, swings across the tent on a rope, and Damiel watches her fully enraptured. She performs a series of aerial acrobatics for the final act, then landing on the ground in a full split to the amusement and laughter of the children. And then balloons drop from the ceiling and all the kids rush the stage to get one. And Marion dances around the stage the whole time making the children laugh. I'm still recording, right? I hope so. Good news gamers, we're still recording. <laughs> Damiel then begins to speak to Cassiel, and the whole while we get these beautiful shots of water and trees and just the beauty of nature. He talks about when they first came to Earth before history had even begun. Back before the rivers had dug into their beds and the water began to flow. He remembers a specific moment watching all of the glaciers melt and the icebergs travel north. He remembers seeing a great green tree with a bird's nest in it. He recalls a series of memories like that. Great migrations, species being born and dying off, and even the grass first growing. He remembers the first word of early humans, the development of language that began the history of humanity. He remembers the first man who stepped against the current, igniting the first war, and how war has persisted until this day. And while he says that war and death persist, so too do nature and life. And Cassiel talks about his memories too. He remembers when the road they are standing on was first made, and then the next instant when Napoleon fled across it. And as they walk around the Berlin Wall, Cassiel asks Damiel if he truly does want to become human. He reiterates that he does. He longs to experience the sensations of the world, what it is like to be seen, and the many smells around them. For too long he has existed apart from the world and apart from time, but now he wants to be a part of it. And again we see Cassiel watching over the old man. You see what I mean about just cutting from one vignette to another vignette? There is no story or through line connecting these events. It is merely the experience of the angels of existing and seeing this thing to existing and seeing this other thing. The old man is reminiscing on the little details of the world around him, and he believes that if more people were in tune with these small innocuous details, then there would be more peace in the world. The little things that only a child notices. We then cut to another man who, um... Content warning ahead. He is standing at the top of a building, preparing to jump off it. Cassiel arrives on the roof and hopes to comfort the man. He hates what Berlin has become, and he is sick and tired of the whirlwind of thoughts and emotions that exist both around him and within him. It seems that the decades of decay to this city has had a profound effect on him. Cassiel tries his best to help this man, but his mind was already made up. He jumps and Cassiel screams out of anger and out of helplessness. While tragic, it is good that we as the audience see that sometimes the comfort of the angels is not enough. They merely exist to try and give strength to the people who need it, but sometimes those people do not take it. Sometimes the people close the door that the angels try and open. And this event launches Cassiel into a bit of a spiral. He flies around the city at blinding speed, taking in all of the misery around him. People without homes, sleeping in the cold, desperate people trying to survive, families falling apart, children being left alone. And finally, he sees the war, the guns and the tanks and the bombs, an entire city on fire. We then join Damiel at the circus, where Marion is preparing for her final trapeze act. It is time to give up on this dream and go looking for a new one. 
She sits in front of her mirror crying to herself, unaware of the fact that there is an angel with her. She practices smiling and then prepares for her performance. And in the circus ring, she takes to the sky, swinging from a rope onto her trapeze. And I'm not sure if me editing this video managed to find B-roll for this scene, but if I did, I want to re-emphasize that the actress for Marion did all of these stunts herself. She learned to do trapeze and high wire acts for this movie. And so all of these techniques that she is executing unassisted are just insanely impressive. Damiel stands and watches the performance. Marion was afraid of falling on her last night, and so Damiel watches over her. It's so cool that even though she's not wearing wings like she did in her first scene, the way she spins the rope behind her does give the shape, almost, of wings behind her back. It re-emphasizes to me just how poetic it is that an angel would fall in love with a woman who reaches up towards the angels. Her final performance was a huge success, and afterwards her and the other performers get together to celebrate. They drink and they sing, and Damiel watches, wishing with every fiber of his being that he could join them. And for the first time in a long time, Marion is happy. She knows that even though this story with her and the circus is closing, another greater story awaits her. And in the great library, Cassiel sits alone. He is still tormented with the boy who jumped. The other angels there only give him a glance, knowing what he is going through. We then cut to Marion who is dancing in a crowd of people to the rock music of the generation. And Damiel and Cassiel are there too. The band in question is called Crime and the City Solution. Yes, they were a very real band. They lasted a whopping two whole years, but then several years later, the lead singer-songwriter for the band formed a new version of the band in 1985. It is this version that we see in the film. Just a fun little tangent for you all, but now back to the actual story. As Marion dances, Damiel grabs her hand invisibly. Even though she cannot see him, she does sense something. The sense of familiarity and comfort that comes with having your hand held. Now she is at home asleep, and in her dreams she sees the flapping of wings. Wings untouched by age or time. And then standing before her, clad in armor with his hands and wings outstretched, is the angel Damiel. Finally, in her dreams, the two meet face to face. They join hands, and the dream ends. We then see Peter Falk at a food truck. Damiel arrives to observe him. But as he does so, Peter turns around and says, I can't see you, but I know you're here. I feel it. This obviously surprises Damiel. None but the children can truly see or sense the angels. And yet, how is Peter able to sense him there? Peter continues to talk to him about how he wishes that he could see who he was talking to face to face, as well as talk about all the lovely sensations around him. The ability to drink coffee, the feeling of rubbing your hands together when it's cold outside, the ability to draw. I wish I could see your face. Just look into your eyes and tell you how good it is to be here. The scene is also kind of funny because the person in the food truck just sees Peter talking to thin air and assumes that Peter is going crazy. It's great because from his perspective, he's just yelling at the thin air. I love the commitment of Peter to these scenes. It's, it's phenomenal. The angels Damiel and Cassiel meet at the Berlin Wall, the wall that divides the city of Berlin. And now Damiel must choose whether or not to fully separate himself from divinity and give himself to mortality. He has chosen to become mortal, to experience all of the ordinary things that make us unique and make us human. They stop walking and look behind them. At some point while they were walking, Damiel's feet started to leave real footprints on the ground behind them. The world around him begins to take on color as his immortality fades away. He dreams of how he will find Marion and how the two will be together just like they are in her dreams. 
And with this, Damiel collapses and reawakens to a world of colors and sensations. As a parting gift from the realm he left behind, he is given his angelic armor. And so he laughs with joy, picks up his armor, and walks into this new world. Feeling something, he touches the back of his head where his armor struck him, and sees that he is now bleeding from a cut in his head. Rather than panicking, he smiles at the sight of blood, a reminder that now he is fully and truly human. Feeling giddy, he approaches a stranger on the road and asks him about the many colors around them and what their names are. He used to be this ethereal being that could be wherever he chose at an instant, but now he is a mortal who walks around the streets of Berlin, overjoyed despite the oppressive cold around him. Using money that the stranger gave him, he buys his first coffee and is able to, for the first time, enjoy the warmth and the taste that comes with it. And as Damiel walks the streets of Berlin, we hear the final excerpt from the poem. When the child was a child, it was enough for it to eat an apple, bread, and so it is even now. When the child was a child, berries filled its hand as only berries do, and do even now. Fresh walnuts made its tongue raw, and do even now. It had on every mountaintop the longing for a higher mountaintop yet, and in every city the longing for an even greater city, and that is still so. It reached for cherries in topmost branches of trees, with an elation it still has today, has a shyness in front of strangers, and has that even now. It awaited the first snow, and waits that way even now. When the child was a child, it threw a stick like a lance against a tree, and it quivers there still today. This conclusion to the poem is a very hopeful one. Sure, a child will eventually grow up, but there will always be children who think and feel with this innocence and purity, and act with a sense of wonder and imagination. And as long as there are children who think and act like this, the world's gonna be okay. Damiel sees an antique shop on the side of the road where he sells his angelic armor to buy human clothes. And this is a really funny scene because his entire existence has been in black and white, having no concept of color. And now that he is mortal, he goes into a store and buys the absolute ugliest suit imaginable. <laughs> it's so perfect because it really is just so him. It's very Damiel coded, if you know what I mean. <laughs> we then cut to the park where the circus used to be. Marion and the other performers are laughing and joking as they help to take the tent down. Meanwhile, Damiel visits the film set, hoping to see Peter. Security doesn't let him in, of course, but through the fence, the two lock eyes and instantly know the other. I'm so happy to see you. How's it going? Fine. See, I expected a much taller man. I don't know why. He asks how long Damiel has been human, but since time is a new concept to him, he has no idea. Peter guesses correctly that Damiel sold his armor, and Peter tells Damiel that he did the same. Jula? Yeah. That's right, Peter Falk used to be an angel like him, but he traded that for the experience of a mortal life. That means that in the universe of this movie, American actor Peter Falk from The Princess Bride is an angel, which honestly just makes perfect sense to me. Peter also mentions that there are many others who chose this path too, which is very comforting for Damiel because he knows that he is not alone. Peter asks what he's going to do next, to which Damiel tells him all about Marion. Peter begins to leave, but Damiel begs him to stay. There is so much that he wishes to know now that he is human. Hey, wait! You wanted to tell me more! I want to know! Everything! All Peter says is that he's going to have to learn that for himself, but that that is the fun part. And in the park, all of the other circus performers depart, leaving only Marion behind. As she sits alone on a patch of sand where the ring used to be, 
Cassiel comes alongside her and listens to her thoughts. The world lies entirely before her now. She has no home, so the future can be whatever she wants. And so she stands with her heart full of hope for the future. Damiel begins running down the street to the park hoping to see Marion. However, when he gets there, she is already gone. Feeling as though he may have missed her forever, he kicks the sand and then sits down where the ring used to be. Cassiel finds him there, Damiel knowing that he can hear his thoughts. He resolves to find her and that when he does, the two can be together and she will teach him all about what it means to be human. Cassiel puts his hand on Damiel's shoulder who feels the presence of his old friend with him. And so he walks the streets of Berlin. He eats an apple and enjoys the taste. He sees Peter Falk on the television, knowing now that he is not the only angel who became mortal. Peter himself goes to a coffee shop at night, and who should he run into there but Marion? The two start talking and Marion admits that she is looking for a man. She doesn't know his name or where he lives, only that once she sees him, she will know. She is looking for the man who came to her in her dreams, the mighty angel who she has sensed watching over her this whole time. Cassiel watches this exchange, and when Marion leaves, Peter starts talking to him too, just as he had with Damiel. Except Cassiel doesn't shake his hand, so it really does just look like Peter is just going insane. <laughs> Roll the clip if you found it, editor. I'm your friend. Compañero. The editor is me, by the way. I'm a one-man army. Not sure where else to look for her, Damiel goes to the concert venue, the same place where she danced earlier. And sure enough, there she is, but the two don't see each other immediately. Damiel goes to the bar, and eventually Marion joins him as well. She stands beside him as he gets his drink, and instantly, the two recognize each other. He takes the glass with his drink in it in both hands, and offers it to her, which she drinks. And she talks about even though she has been alone for so long, she has never truly been alone. Aww. All she asks is that if he chooses to take her hand, he not look away when he does, as so many others have done before. And so he takes her hand, his eyes never leaving hers. It's a small gesture, but you can tell by their performance that they are connected on a level that goes far beyond the physical. There is no such thing as destiny, only decision. And now the woman who touched the sky and the angel who gave up his wings must make a decision. And she says, now we are more than the two of us. We incarnate something. There is no greater story than the one unfolding right now. She has made her decision, and now he must as well. This is the angel from her dreams, the one person with whom she feels she can be truly open. They stand before each other fully willing, fully vulnerable, and fully devoted. She has made her decision, and now he makes his. The two kiss and then embrace, each fully and truly the others. We then cut to the near future. Marion is practicing her aerial acrobatics and Damiel mans the ropes underneath her. And in each other's company, they find the true actualization of each other. Together they are home and together they are complete. As the former angel Damiel says, she came to take me home and I found home. It happened once, once and therefore forever. The image that we created will be with me when I die. I will have lived within it. The amazement about the two of us, amazement about man and woman, has turned me into a human being. I now know what no angel knows. This is where we leave the story of Damiel and Marion. Two beings who started out worlds apart, but then became a part of each other's worlds. Cassiel still flies around the city as an angel, providing comfort to those who need it, and observing history in the most ordinary of places. 
And this is where the story of Wings of Desire comes to a close. The final words are a dedication from the director, saying, Dedicated to all former angels, but especially to Yasujiro, Francois, and Andre. I'm going to read the names off of my notes because it's going to take me forever to memorize them. Yasujiro Ozu, Francois Truffaut, and Andre Tarkovsky were all fellow filmmakers and idols of director vendors. And so he dedicates this film to them, the three angels in his own life. This is such a fascinating film to me, with so many different levels to unpack. The first being something that I've touched on in this video already. This film is a love letter from vendors to the country of Germany, but to Berlin in particular. And in addition to that, it is also a lament for what Germany has become. The people are solitary and isolated, having been beaten down by foreign powers and dictators to the point where there seems to be an oppressive fog over the city. Berlin in particular is quite literally a divided city longing to become whole. And this brings us to the topic of Damiel and Marion. They are initially worlds apart, but each sensing the other. In this story, they represent East and West Berlin. It doesn't matter which represents which because they are both the same. Two halves of a greater whole that long for a fuller existence. And at the end of the film, the two are finally united. Not only do they become a couple, but together they become fully whole. When this film was released, the Berlin Wall was still standing, and for all the people knew, it could have stood for years or decades to come. This film is a hopeful message to the people of Berlin. A message that one day, the barrier will come down, and the beautiful city of Berlin will be whole again. Benders used the story of angels and mortals to tell the story of a unified Germany. But that's not all, because there's another beautiful message in this film as well. You see, while the main characters in the story are angels, they aren't utilized in a conventional religious sense. They aren't viewed as powerful warriors or divine messengers. They are observers, offering invisible comfort to those who need it. They exist in the world, but they are separate from it. And as we see, many angels do decide in this universe to shed their immortal existence in favor of the human experience. This is the other message that the film is telling. The human experience is a wonderful thing, and a thing that we often take for granted. Sure, life has its stresses and its tragedies, of course, but it is special also. Being able to drink coffee, to rub your hands together when it's cold outside, to experience the colors of the world around us. To us, that can seem ordinary and mundane, but it is good to sit down once in a while and reflect on just how magical that is. Humans have a very unique position in this world, a position so special and important that the angels in this film wish they could experience it like us. Of course, none of this is actually theologically accurate, but any good theologian will tell you a similar thing, that the human experience is something to be treasured because it is a valued and special position. In most religious stories about angels engaging with humans in this kind of way, it's always an evil story. The angels fall from grace and become these twisted beings of corruption. But a great quote that I read about this film from legendary film critic Roger Ebert shows me that this is not the case here. In Wings of Desire, Damiel does not fall from grace, but rather falls into it. It is a transition from cosmic divinity into everyday divinity. And this is the true magic of the human experience. As Ebert says, God is in the details. It's in how you remember the fairy lights twinkled in the bar the first time they told you they loved you. The look of pleasure at the film's opening titles on their face and you knowing then this was the last time you were ever going to see them. The particular mug they drank their tea out of. 
that favorite brooch. Few films have focused on everyday divinity with more clarity and compassion than Wim Wenders' Wings of Desire. There is nothing more precious in this universe than the everyday human experience. The mundane acts and memories that give us comfort and give us hope. That is the everyday divinity that is put on full display in Wings of Desire. And I hope that you can appreciate the everyday divinity in your own life, the experiences and the memories you have that make your life special. And with that, thank you everyone so much for watching. And of course, this cannot be understated. A tremendous thank you to you all for your support in the last three weeks. When I made my last video on Shin Godzilla, I was at over 500 subscribers. And now we are nearly at 2,000 subscribers, which is unfathomable to me. Thanks to you all, I made it into the partner program and can now monetize these videos that I make for you all, which is insane. When I started making this style of videos, I assumed that it would be years before I made it to this step, but thanks to you all, we've done it. And so from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for watching, commenting, sharing my videos with your friends and your family. It means the world. And of course, a huge thank you to my patrons who have supported me this long. Sean and my top tier patrons, RD and Snowy. You three have been with me since the beginning of this journey, and it means the world that you are continuing to be here and continuing to support my videos. And if you want to participate in weekly live streams where I talk about the projects I'm working on, uh, exclusive content whenever I am actually working on these projects, as well as a group chat that I have with the patrons, then consider supporting. The link is in the description. I have not opened memberships on this channel purely because I'm still debating whether I should or not, because I already do the exact same thing that I would do here on Patreon. However, I know that there are people who may not like want to create a Patreon account who would support me here on YouTube, so maybe let me know in the comments on whether I should open up memberships on this channel and what I should even offer in these memberships. But with all that, thank you so much for watching this video. Sorry that it was delayed. I had a slew of problems getting this recording done, but I hope that you enjoyed and I hope that this video was worth the wait. And with all that said, I will see you next week for another video. I hope you're excited for that because I know that I am. And cut. <laughs>